Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Back in April 24th, 1990, Space Shuttle Discovery stood ready for the mission STS-31. It would carry one of NASA's most famous payloads into orbit, the Hubble Space Telescope. And over the last 34 years, it has been a cornerstone of space research. But in the last few weeks, we have learned that due to equipment failures over time, it now only has two working gyroscopes. That is one less than the spacecraft was designed to have for pointing at targets. So now it's being switched into what's called one gyro operation, a mode where they shut down the other good gyroscope and they use just one of the gyroscopes to track the rotation of the telescope and use that to point at targets and do science. Now, anyone out there with a basic understanding of three-dimensional geometry will know that you typically need to track three rotations to understand an object's orientation in three-dimensional space. And the Hubble Space Telescope was designed to operate with three gyroscopes doing this. But by reducing it to one, they can actually make it work using other sensors which are used for orientation. And they can save the other good gyroscope for when this final gyroscope fails. So they can extend the life of the telescope. But how does this work? How do you go from a system that's designed to use three down to one? Well, this was described in excruciating detail in a paper titled Hubble Space Telescope Reduced Gyro Control Law Design, Implementation and On-Orbit Performance. This was developed in the mid-2000s after the Columbia disaster and while NASA was not sure whether it would be able to send another servicing mission to the Hubble Space Telescope. Now prior to that, the previous servicing mission had been in 1999 and just before that they actually were down to two gyroscopes and the telescope sat idle waiting for the servicing mission to come. And then in 2001 and 2003 they would lost two of the six gyroscopes and so with the number of available gyroscopes decreasing, they began to seriously look at methods of operating the spacecraft with fewer than the three that were baselined by the design. By February 2005, they were indeed operating using only two op working gyroscopes, and by 2008, they actually tested the single gyroscope mode. And then in 2009, Space Shuttle Atlantis visited Hubble on STS-125 to service it, and they replaced all the gyroscopes with new enhanced gyroscopes. Now, this mission almost didn't happen. There was a lot of concern over it, because after Columbia, the space shuttles were only supposed to go to the International Space Station, so that if there was a problem, the crew could take refuge on the space station while a rescue mission was set up. But this wasn't possible for the Hubble Space Telescope because it was on a different orbital plane. So for this one mission only, they had another space shuttle orbiter stack all integrated and ready to launch should there be some problem. So Hubble's pointing capabilities are nothing short of spectacular. The entire observatory rotates around to point at a target, and it can slew across the sky towards a target uh, to point it within, you know, 10 arc seconds. And then once it actually locks on, it can hold that orientation to within 7 milli arc seconds. And... And for those of you not familiar with these angular measurements astronomers use, 360 degrees, you know, each degree is split into 60 minutes, each minute is split into 60 seconds, that's pretty logical. So the sun is about half a degree on the sky, that means it's 30 minutes of arc across, or 1800 seconds across, and of course a milli arc second is one thousandth of a second, which is a very, very small distance. This is like being able to point exactly into my eye from a couple of hundred miles away and holding that position for hours on end. And if there's any jitter on this, it will blur the images, it will make things move, it will mean the telescope is not able to do the level of science that it needs to do. And to be clear, you have to hold the telescope pointed relative to the object in the sky. And while distant galaxies don't move relative to us, the, the, their position as viewed from a telescope orbiting the Earth does actually move because the light is coming in at the speed of light, whereas the telescope is potentially moving sideways in orbit around the Earth at about 7 kilometers per second. And it moves in one direction first and then on the other side of the orbit it's moving in the other direction. And this accounts for like five arc seconds. So the telescope actually has to wiggle back and forth very slowly to track these targets because of its velocity, orbital velocity around the Earth. 
And while the telescope is floating free in space, it is still subject to small forces which can adjust its orientation. Solar radiation pressure, the Earth's magnetic field, and uh, atmospheric drag can make this more difficult. In fact, there's a point at which the Hubble Space Telescope can no longer do science because it's too low and the atmospheric drag and torques have got too high. And this is called the science floor. So my point is that while the telescope may be appear to be pointed motionless at an object in the sky, it is working very hard to keep that thing motionless. So there's three basic blocks to the attitude control system. There's the sensors that read out the rotations and the orientation. There's the attitude adjustment hardware, which can drive rotations to new orientations. And then there's the computers, which of course connect these two things and command the orientations based upon what the sensors are saying. So the sensor components include the gyroscopes, which I've already mentioned. There are sun sensors, which one of their big jobs is if the telescope points too close to the sun by accident, they will close that window at the, at the top. There are magnetometers that detect the telescope's orientation with reference to the Earth's magnetic field. They have uh, three fixed head star trackers, which point out from the side of the telescope and look for stars to uh, detect those orientations. And then there's fine guidance star trackers, which sit inside near the instruments, looking out through the mirror to actually see what it's looking at. Now, for driving the telescope, they have a set of reaction wheels that spin in one direction so that conservation of angular momentum means the telescope will rotate in the opposite direction. And then they have a set of magnetorquers, which will push against the Earth's magnetic field and allow them to remove excess angular momentum from those reaction wheels. One thing it doesn't have is reaction control thrusters, which most spacecraft have to adjust their orientation. Hubble doesn't have that because blowing chemicals out the side of a high-precision sensor system means that you run the risk of potentially some of that material, the exhaust, coming back and contaminating your, uh, your fine, high-quality sensors. And finally, there is the computer. And I did a, an episode on the computer a while back. It's a DF-224, which was designed over 50 years ago. And while this is a slightly more modern implementation, it's still very old and slow. But on servicing missions, they flew up better computers. They actually have, I think, it's three 486 processors in there, which, uh, well, are absolutely screamingly powerful compared to the onboard systems. But they still actually have to talk to the telescope hardware through the DF-224. So now let's talk about these gyroscopes. I actually tried to find some like deep details on how these gyroscopes were designed and worked, but I couldn't find anything. And then I realized, oh yeah, high quality inertial navigation systems are controlled under ITAR because they're exactly the things that you can use to guide missiles. So I only really have a handful of photos of the exterior, but inside these units, there is a gyroscope which is spinning at about 19,000 RPM. This rides on gas bearings and it's driven by motors and the assembly is inside a sealed chamber inside of this which itself is suspended inside a liquid which helps damp vibrations. So this assembly is allowed to rotate in one axis and it's restrained by springs and as the spacecraft rotates around it, it will get pushed off centre and the amount of deflection will tell you how fast the spacecraft is rotating around it. So these are rate gyro systems. They're not referencing an absolute orientation in space like we saw in Apollo. These are merely telling you how fast the spacecraft is rotating in one axis. So now to get power into this assembly and data out, you have these tiny little wires. These are called flex wires. And because they handle small amounts of motion, they get stressed very slowly over time. And these are the things that break. 22 of the gyroscopes have failed because of flex lead failures. And in the early days, there were problems with the fluid that it was suspended in was corroding the wires, but the enhanced gyros that were installed in 2009 uh, had a plating on there, but that didn't solve the problem apparently. So anyway, these things have miraculous levels of precision. I think we're talking like arc seconds per second, maybe even smaller than that. Uh, they have six of these. They're mounted in pairs inside these rate uh, measurement assemblies, and they are mounted at like angles to each other. And all six gyroscopes are oriented so that none of them have the same uh, sensing angle. And this means you can use any combination of three to get your three degrees sensing. So as I said, this is a rate sensing system and it's the only one that they have. The other systems, the magnetometers and the various star sensors, they can detect a position on the sky, but they don't tell you how fast it's moving. 
But of course, by repeatedly reading these position sensing systems over time, you can actually see the trend and figure out angular velocities. It's just not nearly as good as the gyroscopes. So the, set, the problem comes when you need to move the telescope quickly, that's when the rate of the motion is the most important thing, and that is when you're slewing from one target to another. And so in reduced gyroscope mode, initially they do this slew using the sun sensor, the magnetometer, and the one gyroscope. And while they could usually get this over to within, you know, you know, fraction of an arc minute, now they figure that the orientation could be as bad as 10 degrees off target. And so now from this rough position, they need to walk the precision down to a point where it's usable. And the next step is really the fixed head star trackers. And that's these three dark ovals and circles on the back of the telescope. So the fixed head star trackers are standard NASA star trackers from the 1970s. They're basically little telescopes with eight degree field of view that can lock on, acquire and track stars with magnitudes between two and 6.5 visual. So the brightest stars are too bright for it, they overwhelm the system, but uh, it can also see down to stars which are fainter than what the human eye can really see. So there's three of these, they're pointing different directions, and since they're sending updates 10 times a second, you can measure the rate of rotation of the telescope. So the first thing that was added was just the ability to read these out quickly enough and use it to damp the rotation and get the telescope more or less stable in space. They still have that one gyro helping them damp the rates, but that gyro can't sense any rotation, which is a lot, you know, orthogonal to the gyro's axis. Now the next step is to determine where they're actually pointing, because the precision is worse than the field of view of these telescopes, these uh, star trackers. So they do onboard attitude determination using a star catalog and the brightness of the objects they have. Uh, they figure out where they are pointing in space and then potentially they may have to make further corrections by slewing in the, the right direction and then damping that rotation again using the star trackers. And so using the fixed head star trackers, they're able to put it now within tens of arc seconds of the target. And that's close enough that they can finally use the fine guidance star trackers. So these fine guidance sensors are using the main optical system of the telescope. They're looking down the bore and they're off to the sides. There's three of them and they have little mirrors that extend out into the optical path and they can use these mirrors to pick out just one star which is very close to the target and divert the light into their uh, sensing system. If you look at these diagrams, this shows the focal plane of the telescope and those uh, arcs around the outside, the uh, left, top and right, those are where the fine guidance sensors can place their mirrors to pick off those stars and analyze their light. And the fine guidance sensors are actually huge instruments in their own right. They actually can do high speed photometry. They can be used to do things like uh, observe small motions in stars that are wobbling because there's planets around them. So these fine guidance sensors can see stars as faint as something like 15th magnitude. They're looking for tiny stars near the target. They're picking them off. They're measuring the rotation, the orientation. They adjust, use that information to adjust the positioning, the orientation of the telescope to point at the exact target. And then it's them that are doing the small detections of motion over time to make sure that the telescope is constantly pointed at the target and not blurring the images. And so with all these systems working together, the telescope can still point at the target and still do top quality science. But it now takes a whole lot longer to move from one orientation to the other because they can't do it as precisely and they now have to detect the rotation and null out that rotation using star trackers, which weren't really designed to do that. And so this means there's less time available on Hubble because it takes longer to go from one observation to the next. And there's a handful of observations of close, fast moving objects that it can't actually track anymore. So while it'll operate for now long term, it is still descending towards the Earth. And the people behind Hubble have declined any offer of a servicing mission by a private company. There's certainly no prospect right now of replacing the rate gyro units the, as in previous missions. And so they prefer not to risk the science they could get from it now. But uh, that being said, there are a few people pointing out that the current solar cycle is exceeding expectations and that could cause the atmosphere to balloon out and cause the end of the Hubble mission faster than they anticipated. So I would say let's not snooze on this. I'm Scott Manley. 
fly safe.